Dr. Pepper and the Southwest Conference. Just what the doctor ordered. Thank you with all my heart for giving me this trophy. You deserve to be number one, and that's what you are. years of its existence, the Southwest Conference has arguably earned the right to be called one of the greatest college football conferences of all times. With legendary stars like Sammy Baugh, John David Crow, and Earl Campbell. Great coaches including Darrell Royal, Dutch Meyer, Frank Royals. Memorable games such as the 1935 SMU versus TCU game. The 1956 TCU versus Texas A&M Hurricane game. And of course, the 1969 big shootout, pitting top-ranked Texas against number two Arkansas, remembered by many as the game of the century. This is the legacy known as the great days of the Southwest Conference. The first big shootout in the Southwest Conference took place between SMU and TCU on November the 30th, 1935. Coached by Dutch Meyer and relying on the arm of slinging Sammy Baugh, TCU tied it up late in the fourth quarter. The game turned when SMU standout Bobby Wilson reeled in a 37-yard touchdown pass from Bob Findlay on a fake punt to put SMU on top for good, 20 to 14. They are Smith called to play and family dropped back way back and the only thing that was said in the huddle was that uh, be sure it goes over the goal line now you can <laughs> go from there but he dropped back maybe two or three more yards and got set and we were on the weak side field ball like all safeties played to the wide side for the punt and uh, as I went down the field, as I got around, I guess, the two or three yard line, I could tell the ball was coming over my old other shoulder. I could, so I turned in midair and caught the ball on, on the other shoulder, and I guess I was over the goal line when I came down, and that, that was it. It wasn't, it wasn't really what you call a good football game because TCU couldn't do anything but pass. They got both of their runners were knocked out. And they had to run, so we weren't going to run. We, we ran and didn't pass, and they had to pass. And that's what I'm saying, it wasn't, it was a spectacular game for the people in the stands. Matty Bell's SMU Mustangs went on to a national championship at a 1936 Rose Bowl matchup against Stanford. Former A&M coach, the legendary Dana X. Bible, had a five-year plan to return the Texas Longhorns to their early greatness. In the fourth season of his return, the underrated Longhorns faced the number one ranked and defending national champion, Texas A&M Aggies. In the opening series, Pete Layden hit Noble Doss on a long pass to the Aggie one. Then Layden carried it over for the only score of the game as Texas held on to snap A&M's 19-game winning streak, 7-0. Our practice during that week was very bad. We, we were so concerned about the tradition that A&M had never won a ball game in Memorial Stadium. And, um, you know, that's, that was a big load. That's what we had on our minds all week long practicing, and, and we, we didn't want to be known as a team that broke the tradition. Because that would be, Texas had such a great tradition all up to that time. And, and to think that you were on the team that broke that tradition, it's something you'd live with, I would, the rest of my life. And I didn't want to be known that way, and I don't think anybody else did either. It was a game that, uh, of course, had a lot of motion on both sides. 
they were on the way to the Rose Bowl. No question about that. They had already practically accepted the invitation to go to the Rose Bowl, and there would be national championship uh, team again. So um, uh, we just very, very fortunate to win the ball game and, and uh, preserve the tradi tradi tradition that, that uh, Longhorns have here. Texas used only 13 players to upset the Aggies and their exploits on Thanksgiving Day 1940 meant that the Longhorn faithful would forever retail the tale of the Immortal 13. The Southwest Conference top two teams from the mid-1950s matched up midway through the 1956 season to decide the conference's best for that year. TCU was the defending Southwest Conference champion and was on its way to a second consecutive Cotton Bowl berth. A&M was in the midst of a 9-0-1 season in Paul Bear Bryant's third season in Aggieland. The Aggies were banned from postseason competition but would finish their first unbeaten season since 1939 and capture their first Southwest Conference title since 1941. When TCU came to town, the Horn Frogs were ranked number four and the Aggies were number 14. TCU, an eight-point favorite, entered the game wanting to extract revenge for A&M's 19-16 upset in the previous season, which was the only blot on TCU's 1955 regular season ledger. With the wind and rain beating down and tornadoes nearby, A&M withstood countless TCU scoring bids to take the upper hand with a 7-6 victory. And it was a very heart-breaking loss for us because uh, the films, without a doubt, showing Jim Swank going over the goal line twice and the, and the ball being brought back and not scoring that touchdown uh, was the, uh, caused us to have the loss. It was a great ball game, John David Crow and uh, Kruger and all that uh, great A&M group, Jack Pardee, I mean, they had a great group, as did TCU uh, with Swank and Chuck Curtis and O'Day Williams and Vernon Necker, Buddy Dyke. We had quite a group, Hallback. So, you know, it was a great ball game, and I'm sure that uh, it'll go down in the annuals as one of the great games ever played in the Southwest Conference, and it was played under very adverse conditions. Uh, if there's ever one, it should have been postponed. It was that one. Texas A&M 7 to nothing defeat of TCU in the so-called Hurricane game is considered by many to be the Southwest Conference most memorable game of the 1950s. Arkansas fans say that the echoes of this magnificent contest will be heard in Razorback Stadium for decades to come. On October the 26th, 1965, the number one ranked Longhorns of the University of Texas squared off against the Razorbacks of Arkansas in Fayetteville. The Hogs were defending a Southwest Conference title at a shared national championship. The game started badly for the Longhorns, and before they knew it, they trailed the Razorbacks 20 to nothing. Texas quarterback Marvin Kristinick then scored a couple of touchdowns, and with the help of three David Conway field goals, the Horns led the Hogs by a score of 24 to 20, with 4.06 to go. Arkansas then answered with one of the finest drives in its history, by marching 80 yards with the tandem of quarterback John Brittenham and All-American Bobby Crockett to put the game away for Arkansas. The Texas-Arkansas game has been uh, a big, regional rivalry and most of the years <clears throat> has been a national rivalry. It started back in the early 60s when Texas was having so much success and Arkansas was trying to build to compete with Texas and we had the good fortune of having some of the games on television that were ready to be the most exciting games of the year and that added the fuel, the intensity to the games and then the regional conference uh, championship and sometimes a national championship rested on the outcome of this game. So the rivalry intensified uh, because of the, of the uh, uh, things that were at stake at that, during, for the contest. I was uh, uh, amazed at the way the Arkansas people uh, learned to, to um, hate Texas <laughs> and to feel that that was the biggest game of the year. And it soon became the, the you, we, you defeat Texas and you've had a successful year. Uh, Texas has this with a lot of opponents, but this is the only one that we had it with, so it was the game for Arkansas. 
Arkansas's victory gave them bragging rights over Texas for one more year and the number one ranking in the nation. The site, Razorback Stadium in Fayetteville. On the line was the national championship, the Southwest Conference Championship, and the host spot against Notre Dame in the Cotton Bowl. Arkansas On December the 6th, 1969, the game known as the Big Shootout took place in Fayetteville, Arkansas, in front of President Richard Nixon and a national television audience. Texas and Arkansas were both undefeated and were ranked number one and number two respectively in the climactic game of the centennial season of college football. It was a chilly day in the 30s, and in keeping with the weather, Texas got off to an ice-cold start and trailed 14 to nothing after three quarters. Texas came crashing out of the freezer in the opening minutes of the fourth quarter when quarterback James Street scrambled 65 yards in a broken play for the first Longhorn score. After a two-point conversion option made the score 14 to 8, Arkansas answered by moving the ball down to the Texas 7 before Danny Lester picked off a short pass for the interception. With only 447 left to play and Texas facing a fourth and three on its own 43-yard line, Coach Royal made a gutsy call, a veer pass. Street hit Randy Peschel on the run to the Arkansas 13 at a first down. Texas tailback Jim Bertelson rumbled over from the two at the go-ahead score. I give Coach Royal a lot of credit. Again, uh, having the ability to make that call at that time, I think, takes a lot of guts, takes a lot of insight, and just uh, he never thought about what the outcome, and we've discussed it many times since then, and if, if it hadn't worked, the pass play hadn't worked, it would probably been called uh, the dumbest play in history. But as it turned out, we go to the sideline. Emory Blard is the offensive coordinator. He's in the, in the box. And myself, all three of us are on the phone, Coach Royal and Emory and myself, uh, talking about uh, what play to run. Well, Coach Blard and I both wanted to run the exact same play, which was to set the formation to the wide side of the field and run a counter option back into the short side of the field because they had overshifted all, all day long into the wide side of the field. Coach Royal out of nowhere, never been discussed or anything, says right 53 veer pass. Caught us both off guard. Uh, again, I thought it would work, but uh, I, I couldn't believe the call. In fact, after I started onto the field, I came back to make sure, and I wasn't really questioning his call, I was questioning the formation to make sure that we were both on the same page and uh, went out there and it worked. Texas had a 15 to 14 win at a national championship in a game that will go down as one of the greatest football exhibitions in the history of the Southwest Conference and the game of the century. On New Year's Day 1970, Coach Errol Parsegian's Fighting Irish of Notre Dame ending their 44 year ban on bowl games face the powerful wishbone offense of Texas in the Cotton Bowl. On a wet and torn up field, the result of an NFL playoff game the night before, Joe Theismann quickly put the Irish up 10 to nothing. But Texas answered with a nine play drive to come within three. In the fourth quarter, Coy of Texas capped a 77 yard drive to put Texas up 14 to 10. But Theismann and the Irish came right back with a 24-yard touchdown pass to put Notre Dame back on top with only 6.52 remaining. 13 plays later, facing a fourth and two, Street connected with Cotton Spire to put Texas on the two. Two plays later, Billy Dale pulled his way into the end zone for the win at a perfect season for the national champion Longhorns. That was a hard ball game. We're behind with about six and a half minutes, seven minutes to go. And we're, I don't know, we're deep in our end of the field. And we started moving the ball with a running attack. And all this time we're eating up clock. So it looks like if, if we drive down there and use up all the time and don't score, then we're, we've lost any chance. But we decided to go with what we did best, and we thought running game was the best thing we did. And uh, we could execute that better than we could the passing game. And uh, so we stayed on the ground and, uh, and scored. Arkansas, uh, Arkansas, Notre Dame came right back 
on us, and we had to intercept a pass to kill that kill their drive at the end of the game, even after us going down and scoring, using up all that clock. Texas would remain unbeaten throughout the following regular season. On November the 9th, 1974, known as the crown jewel of Grant Taft's miracle on the Brazos, the Texas Longhorns dropped their first game to Baylor in 18 years, with the Bears scored 27 points in the second half for a colossal upset. Grant Taft, coach of Baylor, introduced a new counter for the wishbone offense of Texas. The Texas was not prepared for it. Baylor switched the responsibilities of the cornerbacks and defensive ends which left the cornerbacks free to pursue Texas quarterback Aikens on the option. This master stroke of coaching by Taft and the 34-24 win led to Baylor's first Southwest Conference title in 50 years. Well, one would have to remember that uh, Baylor hadn't beaten Texas in 19 years. And so it was a very big game for Baylor. Probably was not that big a game for the University of Texas since they had been the Southwest Conference champion six years in a row and they were picked to uh, be that again and Baylor was picked dead last. So I think our probably, our emotions were a little different than the University of Texas. Uh, we, we wanted to win, we uh, felt like we were prepared to win. We get in the game and uh, we end up 24 to 7 down at halftime. People began to leave the stands, said the same old thing, Texas is going to cream Baylor and go on and win their seventh championship in a row. But something happened on the way to the second half, and that was uh, we had some really strong leaders on our football team, Neil Jeffrey and others that uh, came into that dressing room at halftime very confident that they could come back and win. Uh, very frankly, their confidence uh, uh, really uh, gave me confidence. We went back out, we had always been good at the kicking game and we blocked the punt and that turned the game around and we ended uh, up winning it uh, 34 to 24 and uh, the fans came back in the stands, they left the lights on all night and the scoreboard. Darrell Royal came into the dressing room after the game was over and told our players they should go all the way. We took him at his word and went all the way. To celebrate the occasion of this victory, the scoreboard light stayed on all night at Floyd Casey Stadium so that Bears all over Waco would remember the miracle on the Brazos. On October the 30th, 1976, Texas, after losing their opener to Boston College, squared off against the Red Raiders of Texas Tech, a game that proved costly for Texas. Earl Campbell injured a hamstring and would be out for the next four games. But Texas still led by four points before Tech quarterback Rodney Allison rallied the Red Raiders in the fourth quarter. Billy Taylor's second TD of the day capped a 76-yard, 15-play drive that kept fifth-ranked Texas Tech unbeaten in the Southwest Conference. Tech would finish the season tied with Houston for its first Southwest Conference title in school history. In 1986, Southwest Conference observers will always point to a game that they hail as one of the greatest comebacks in the conference's history. Grant Tapp's Bears, which had not lost to A&M since 1982, handed the Aggies their only Southwest Conference loss in 1985 and were 6-1-1 against the Aggies since 1978. After the first quarter, it appeared Baylor still had A&M's number as the Bears led 17-0. The margin could have been worse if not for a goal line stand by A&M that prevented a third Baylor touchdown. A&M awoke in the second quarter as Kevin Murray led an 80-yard 12-play march that ended with a five-yard scoring pass to tight end Rod Bernstein. On A&M's next possession, Murray hit split in Rod Harris for 68 yards on a crossing pattern to set up a one-yard scoring keeper by Murray. Baylor led at halftime 20 to 14 and extended the lead to 27 to 17 after three quarters when Bear quarterback Cody Carlson scored on a three yard run. Murray enjoying his finest day as the Aggie signal caller would not be denied. He led his team back with a 74 yard drive capped by a five yard scoring pass to Keith Woodside. 
Murray keyed a final march to victory that ended with a four-yard pass to Tony Thompson, who bobbled the ball before catching it for the tying touchdown. Scott Slater's conversion kick won it. The, the 1986 Baylor game was one of the best that I've ever been involved with. Uh, Baylor had an outstanding team that year. Uh, we had a good team. Both teams were high-powered on offense and, and had real strong defenses. So we knew it was going to be a good game. I, I remember Baylor throwing a, a little hitch screen, crack screen early in the game and going about 40 yards uh, with, for the touchdown with that. We got down 17 to nothing in that game, and Baylor actually had the ball on our goal line trying to, trying to go in to, to make it uh, uh, another touchdown, 24. And uh, they elected at the end, we held them three downs, and instead of kicking the field goal to make it 20, they elected to go for it on fourth and one, and we stopped them. And we turned around, we took that ball, and our offense went 99 yards for a touchdown to make it 17 to seven. And we came back and won that game. And really, what a, what a great contest uh, because there was outstanding defense played on both sides and both quarterbacks played well. Uh, uh, Baylor at that time actually had two quarterbacks, Cody Carlson and, and a young man named Mickey that was uh, a quarterback. And they alternated those guys. But uh, certainly one of the most exciting games from a fan standpoint and from a coach's standpoint, being down there close, uh, uh, that fourth and one uh, will be a play I'll always remember. This game was named by Texas football voters as the game of the 80s. Any mention of great games must include mention of the great players who were such a vital part of those games. With its share of All-Americans, Heisman, Outland, and Lombardi Trophy winners, the Southwest Conference has always produced the finest football players in the land. In the mid-30s, the Horn Frogs were elevated to national prominence, much to the outstanding versatility and athletic abilities of slinging Sammy Baugh and later Davey O'Brien. Baugh, originally enrolled at the University of Texas as a baseball player, led TCU to a victory in the 1936 Sugar Bowl, and the following year championed the purple and white to victory in the first Cotton Bowl. Slingin' Sammy was the Frogs quarterback, punted, and even played defensive back. Ball was the number one draft pick of the Washington Redskins and went on to a stellar career in the NFL. Sammy Ball, a true Southwest Conference champion. I, I, learned, I, I learned most of my football right at TCU under Dutch Meyer. I, I didn't learn a damn thing in pro because we were we, well, they didn't play the brand of ball T.C. played in those days. And uh, they didn't want you to throw the ball when you got the 20-yard line and throw. Nobody would throw the ball. Until the third and long, that's when they'd throw. And in uh, college, a lot of colleges you're doing, that's the way they play. They didn't, they didn't throw first down and stuff like that. And we were, that's the way, that's the way David and I were taught. And, uh, I, I've got a feeling we were the only damn quarterbacks getting that kind of teaching in those days. In 1937, TCU was again aided with the talents of an outstanding quarterback in the form of Lil Davy O'Brien. Given the nickname Lil Davy because he was only 5'7 and weighed 145 pounds. O'Brien guided the Horn Frogs to the 1938 National Championship and was named the first Heisman Trophy winner from the Southwest Conference and the first from any school west of the Mississippi. Legendary TCU coach Dutch Meyer said, Bob may have been a better all-around player and a better passer, but as a field general, O'Brien was the finest play selector I have seen. Well, he was really a thinking man's quarterback and, and he was so durable. He, he was a 60-minute player. He's very good on defense, on, on uh, punt returns, and uh, just really a superlative passer. Uh, I, I saw him at a, you know, a big game here in Waco, and a uh, marvelous short passer. They just couldn't stop him. Uh, and, of course, he proved that in the pros, where he was uh, one of the NFL's top passers before he became an FBI agent the latter part of his uh, uh, career and, and on into his life. The second Heisman Trophy winner of the Southwest Conference joined the Mustangs of SMU in 1945. 
The 165-pound halfback was known for pulling games out of his hat. It became one of the first post-war superstars of the conference. An all-around athlete, he played on SMU's basketball and baseball teams. His name, Doak Walker. Doak's exciting style of play and incredible statistics, such as 312 points in four seasons, a 29-yard kickoff return average, and eight interceptions as a defensive back, clearly places him on a pedestal as one of the Southwest Conference's greatest. At that time, was uh, kind of a hero worship uh, era. Uh, guys had just come back out of the service, and it was a uh, start of a whole new life for a lot of people. And uh, I think the collegiate life was uh, probably as high ebb as, uh, as it's ever been. And uh, college football uh, was probably at its peak during those years of, of being accepted and uh, nationally by everybody. Uh, the students, the, the, I guess the faculties, the coaches, uh, and uh, just in general, the whole, whole United States. Coach Bear Bryant had only one Heisman Trophy winner in his career in the form of John David Crow. Hidden in 1954 from rival recruiters at the famous training camp in Junction, Texas, Crow played under Bryant at A&M 1955 through 1957 and led the Aggies to an undefeated season in 1956. This star running back's first touchdown, a 77-yard scramble against LSU was described by Coach Bryant as the greatest run he ever saw. When we played, it was a different game. Uh, you, you had to play both ways. You had no free substitution, uh, so you had to play offense and defense. It was more of a, 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 a who could outlast uh, the, other, the other person longest. Who could, uh, who could take more punishment? Uh, who could... Uh, uh, not get tired, you know, uh, because uh, uh, fatigue makes cowards of us all. I remember hearing that many, many times. And, and uh, because y if you're in better shape in the fourth quarter, you'll eventually win. And, and now it's it's a skill game. It's a it's a game of of, of more or less kind of chess, or, or, or in in some respects, because you uh, most people have pretty good talent. Uh, uh, but they, but how you play the game and the techniques and and, and the philosophy and, and what you do on the field, uh, a lot of times determine uh, mo most of the time determine the, the outcome of the game. But when I played, it was more or less who was the toughest and who could outlast the team and stay ready and, and who's in the best condition. 1963 brought the Longhorns a trim-setting linebacker named Tommy Nobis. This 1965 Outland, Maxwell, and Rockney Trophy winner was a key player in the 1963 Texas team, which captured the national championship. For years after he left Texas, Longhorn freshmen were required to face his portrait and sing The Eyes of Texas in honor of this great player. A 1964 consensus All-American, Nobis was a ferocious hitter who attacked ball carriers chest high and stood them up straight. His motto, hit them in the goozle. There are days when you, you're, you're, you're cussing your coaches and you're second guessing them, and particularly during two days or during spring practice and in the state of Texas when it can be 90 degrees, 100 degrees, whatever it might be, you, you can, and you really don't, you're young, and uh, you know, you're, you're, you're really not as smart as you've become as time goes on. And you don't appreciate, you don't take the time to appreciate what is really happening to you in your life. And I think that's really what causes that. But uh, no, I, I knew that uh, from the get-go that uh, I had made the right decision in going to the University of Texas uh, uh, because of what was happening. Uh, you pay a price, uh, and you pay that price and good things happen and that's what that program was all about then. Known as the Golden Palomino, Texas Tech star running back Donnie Anderson finished fourth in the Heisman Trophy voting of 1965. An All-American in 64 and 65, Anderson led Tech to appearances in the Sun and Gator Bowls. 
His 5,156 all-purpose yardage total ranks him fourth all-time in the conference and amazingly was amassed in only three years. A 90-yard run against TCU in 1964 still ranks as the longest run in school history. Anderson was the Southwest Conference Player of the Year, won the SWC Sportsmanship Award, and was drafted by the Houston Oilers of the AFL and the Green Bay Packers of the NFL after his junior season. The game of football is not just a game of two, two teams that have uh, this enemy thought that they're going to go out and, and beat up on each other. It, it's a gentleman's game that's, that, to, to my knowledge, that you go out and you execute. And the person that taught me this more than any other man was Vince Lombardi, is that you may, who makes the fewest mistakes wins. Well, that's in business, that's in any type of game and war, is who is disciplined. 4,443 yards between 1974 and 1977. 10 100-yard games in 1977 alone. These numbers, though awesome, do not do justice to the accomplishments of Heisman Trophy winner and Texas Longhorn tailback Earl Christian Campbell. He could and often did stiff arm anyone he met on the field while turning the corner on his way to set the league record of 1,774 yards in the 1977 season. A punishing runner, Campbell always left a horde of opposing defenders in his wake. In head-to-head -head joust, would-be tacklers often got only a handful of his jersey and a mouthful of turf. Known as the Tyler Rose, Earl Campbell will always be remembered for his awesome talents on the field and his unassuming manner off of it. I didn't realize what the Heisman Trophy was until I was working on help building Bass Hall over at the university, you know, right in front of the stadium. Well, my summer job was toting plywood, you know, a little, uh, where the baseball field was down there, there's a little stream down there. Well, my job was towing plywood from, I jumped across that stream and towed the plywood up the hill for the whole summer. That was my job. Well, this guy that had won the Heisman the year before me always got in trouble every day. Every day I'd go down to the locker room, I'd always read this while I'd be working out after construction work. This Heisman Trophy winner, Tony Dorsett, said, did this, did that, did something in Dallas. And then it's, you know, that's a shame because this guy won the Heisman Trophy, got a million dollars. And then I started saying, working out with Frank that summer, I said, I'm gonna win the Heisman Trophy next year. And that's how I understood what the Heisman was because of Tony. I never paid no attention to it because before then. 1977 through 1980, Baylor championed a linebacker that would eventually become the player of the decade for the Southwest Conference. A three-year starter, 5'11", 230-pound Mike Singletary had the size and speed to be a good linebacker. But what set him apart was his intensity, intelligence, and leadership. A consensus All-American with an astounding 662 career tackles, Singletary left the Bears of the Southwest Conference for a stellar career as an NFL Bear. Always respectful, Singletary still refers to Coach Grant Taft as dad. But I, I guess the greatest thing that, that I could think of when I really think about what this means is all the guys that I played with and all the coaches that I had the opportunity to play for. <laughs> it's truly been the greatest experience of my life as a football player. Coming to Baylor University helped me in so many ways. Helped me as a person, as a young man seeking for guidance. Having Coach Tab here, uh, I still call him Dad. Um, means a lot. Playing with guys like Walter Abercrombie and Dennis Gentry and Lester Ward, Bill Field, Scott. It means a lot. And the guys that are here, you don't really know what that means until you ask other guys that are playing professional football now. If you had it to do all over again, would you go back to that same school? 
95 percent of them will tell you no but i tell you i know that i would do it in new york man because it was so much fun so much fun those days i'll never ever forget as a famed member of smu's pony express Tailback Eric Dickerson teamed with Craig James to propel the Mustangs into an 11-0-1 season in 1982, when the Mustangs finished number two in the nation. Dickerson became SMU's all-time leading rusher and third in the history of the Southwest Conference by amassing 4,450 yards in 790 attempts. A combination of power and grace, Dickerson was another in a long line of outstanding SNU superstars like Doak Walker, Kyle Rote, and Jerry Levias. Eric Dickerson was voted a consensus All-American in 1982. Born in Galveston, Texas in 1968, University of Houston quarterback Andre Ware gained the national spotlight by commanding the innovative run-and-shoot offense. He completed 660 passes out of 1,074 attempts and set an NCAA record with 340 yards of total offense in one quarter. Ware also set another NCAA record in 1989 by passing for 4,699 yards. In that year alone, Ware set 26 NCAA passing and total offense records. Named as the Southwest Conference's Player of the Decade, Andre Ware won the Heisman Trophy for 1989. The Southwest Conference has, through the past 80 seasons, fielded many great teams which have given fans all over the world countless hours of excitement and enjoyment. Though every fan of the conference has his or her favorite, many agree that the following are 10 of the greatest football teams to play under the banner of the Southwest Conference. In 1935, the SMU Mustangs, coached by Matty Bell, beat number two ranked TCU to nail down an unblemished regular season record at a trip to the Rose Bowl. With a 12-1 record, they were crowned national champions that year. We were all seniors. We had the only ball club. I think we had one junior was Finley, Bob Finley. And that was about, uh, we just, we just got lucky. Ball has to bounce your way, if, you know, on every ball game. We played 12 ball games. And some of the ball game, the last ball game we played was against a and that year. And uh, they actually, I think they both gained 175 yards. We gained 124, maybe. But we beat them 24 to nothing. But they actually outplayed us. As far as statistics go, and that's what I'm saying, sometimes you just, it goes your way and that's, that's it. Coach Dutch Meyer had a powerhouse team in 1938 with his TCU Horn Frogs. Led by the Southwest Conference's first Heisman Trophy winner, Davey O'Brien, they had a perfect 11-0 season, won the 1939 Sugar Bowl, and were named national champions for the year. The Southwest Conference had had some outstanding football teams before 1938. TCU and SMU in 1935, TCU in 32, and Rice in 34. But never until 1938 had the league had an undisputed national champion, a team that was undefeated, untied, through 11 games. That's what TCU did in 1938. It had the league's first Heisman Trophy winner in 5'7", 150-pound Davy O'Brien, who was the nation's top passer. It had two all other All-Americans in Kai Aldrich, a center, and tackle Ivy Hale. It was a team that never trailed in an entire game, that entire season, until it got to the Sugar Bowl, when one time it got behind Carnegie Tech. As soon as it got the ball, it went back ahead, never trailed again. It truly was Coach Dutch Meyer's masterpiece. In 1939, Coach Homer Norton's Texas A&M team, led by Jaron John Kimbrough, and a terrific defense held their opponents to an NCAA record of 1.71 yards per play. 
The 1939 Aggies had a perfect 11-0 season and were named national champions. They then punctuated their success by edging Tulane 14-13 to win their first ever Sugar Bowl. Well, you know, we had two a days in September. And uh, even in spring training that year, it seemed like the, the team clicked a lot better. We could uh, do things a lot better. And in the fall practice, we did good. And then the first few games we won, and it just sort of steamrolled from there on. And uh, we had a good season. In 1956, the Texas A&M Aggies were powered by Heisman Trophy winner John David Crow. Bear Bryant's team went on that year to become the Southwest Conference champions with a record of 9-0-1 and were ranked number five by the Associated Press. The 1956 Aggies outscored their opponents 223-81. to Well, I think when, when you talk about the old days, I, you know, I, it, it'd be very difficult for me to talk about the different skills of people. When I, when I was here, Coach Bryant was our, our coach, and, and really and truly you were trying to survive the practice, and then the game day was, you know, was like a, having a picnic. And, uh, and, and I couldn't judge, you know, i tell you the truth, I couldn't judge the skills. I was, I was too busy trying to, to survive the practice and trying to sharpen my skills to where I could please, uh, please Coach Bryant. But uh, I'm sure that's the case. I, I think that uh, I think any time you have a, a people from the, uh, that are that together together to, 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 to do anything, and if they're from the same general part of the, of the country, I, I think that there's an awful lot of uh, likeness and closeness that, uh, that they develop. The 1961 Texas Longhorns, ranked number three by AP, went 10 and one that season. This Southwest Conference team used Coach Darrell Royal's new flip-flop formation to outscore their opponents 303 to 66. Their only loss that year was a surprising upset to TCU, six to nothing, with Texas star back James Saxton was knocked out twice during the game. The 61 team uh, was a great offensive team, but most people really don't understand it. it was one of the best defensive teams that Texas has ever had because it held our opponents, uh, their points down considerably. The offense was, uh, was outstanding because we had a great line. Uh, we had a fellow, Jack Collins, who moved from tailback to uh, wingback, who threw every key block on every long run I made. Uh, so we all were doing uh, things differently than what we had done, but we all worked together as a team and we had great coaching and Coach Rawls is a great psychologist and he kept us pumped up and, and uh, it just turned out. Obviously we had some disappointments. Uh, we were number one in the country and then uh, TCU knocked us off and that was a great disappointment. I guess the only good thing for me on that game is I slept through it. 1963 was a banner year for the Texas Longhorns, again coached by Darrell Royal. With their first 11-win season, Texas outscored their opponents 243-71. to After surviving close wins against Baylor and A&M, Texas whipped a Roger Staubach-led Navy team 28-6 the 1964 Cotton Bowl in national championship style. I'm not sure going in that we realized how important that was to people other than on the team. And I think that's what I, I saw as far as the national championship and winning that is the, the alumni and the people all over the world that were University of Texas Exes. And even to this day when I, and I know all the guys that are in the picture behind me here, when you go in, whether you're doing a business deal or, or making a contact, they, they may not remember what jersey number you wore, they may not remember what you played, but they say, well, you were on that national championship team. And so it, it's been a lifelong thing that I've enjoyed. It wasn't just something that happened that year, and then it was gone. And even after other national championships, uh, you're placed into a unique group, and so, it's been exciting throughout my entire life. And of course, 
being in the coaching profession, I got to enjoy it probably more than maybe some of the other guys that were in some other areas because I did finally realize how, what an outstanding feat that was for a group of men to come in and win a national championship. After a 5-5 finish in 1963, the Razorbacks of Arkansas were picked to finish near the middle of the pack in 1964. No one would have predicted an undefeated season and a national championship. But with a coaching staff that included Barry Switzer and Johnny Majors, and with players like Jimmy Johnson, Jerry Jones, and Ken Hatfield, one could tell this team had the will to win. Utilizing a crushing defense led by Lloyd Phillips, the Porkers beat defending national champions Texas 14-13 in Austin on the strength of Hatfield's 81-yard punt return. They then proceeded to shut out five straight Southwest Conference opponents, then pushed past sixth-ranked Nebraska 10-7 in the Cotton Bowl for a perfect 11-0 mark and the national championship. The 64 team did not have the most ability of, of, of teams we had at Arkansas, but they had the best morale, they had the best attitude, they had the most character of doing what had to be done, and we got on a roll. Um, we started slowly and won some games that uh, we might have lost against teams we should have beaten, but all of a sudden they began to realize that there was a big prize at the end of the season and we've said uh, through the years you can look at uh, Jimmy Johnson, Jerry Jones, Jim Lindsay, uh, Jerry Lamb, uh, all, I just go on and on of the successful careers that these men have had after graduation to show that this team had something from the inside and when we start this role of shutting the opponents out uh, giving them a, a, a goose egg and, and points, uh, you cannot believe the way they played. They played like Superman. We shut out the last five, after we got one shut out and the second shut out, that's all we talked about. We're going to shut the next team. And they played better than their ability. And that's what championship teams do, is play better than their ability. And the average players play great, and the great players play even greater. And that's what happened in this team. Considered by many to be the greatest Southwest Conference team of all time, the 1969 Texas Longhorns, utilizing a devastating wishbone offense refined from the previous year, propelled themselves to a perfect 11-0 season. As an entire nation set spellbound, Texas staged a dramatic comeback victory over number two ranked Arkansas. After being named national champions, they went on to beat Joe Theismann and a powerful Notre Dame team in the 1970 Cotton Bowl. We won all the close games. We, uh, we won the, the one-pointer against Arkansas. And some people we did blow away, uh, quite a few of them. We had, to, we had to make some good drives to come back a couple of times in 69. But uh, we finished up 11-0. and and, and from the long streak from before, so that put us at about 20-something wins in a row. So uh, we easily uh, were voted the, in all the polls as national champs that year. It was a good football team. I don't mean to put it down. Uh, I think the personnel was probably better than 68, but the newness of the wishbone made us better at the end of the year uh, than the 69 at the end of the year. In 1982, the SMU Mustangs led throughout the season by backfield tandem of Eric Dickerson and Craig James. Finished with a record of 11-0-1, were ranked number two by the Associated Press and were crowned champions of the Southwest Conference. The Ponies outscored their opponents that year 354 to 160 and roped Dan Marino and Pittsburgh in the 1983 Cotton Bowl. I remember one of the key selling points for the coaching staff was they used to tell me as a senior, hey, the Cotton Bowl is the house that Doak and Kyle Rote built. We're going to Texas Stadium. It can be the house that Dickerson and James built. And I thought at the time, you know, Doak Walker and Kyle Rote, man, who are those guys? You know, I've heard of them, but what about the Cotton Bowl and the house they built? And so as time went by, and I was a part of history in the making, uh, it really became a special deal because I knew that Kyle and Doak were watching and that they knew what was going on and that was special to me. 
The 1992 Texas A&M team finished the regular season with an unblemished 12-0 record. Continuing its dominance of its Southwest Conference brethren, the Aggies claimed their fifth Southwest Conference title in seven years. The team we had in, in uh, 1992 was really a special group of young men. Uh, we started off the year, had a great trip. We went out and played in the Pigskin Classic in California, in Anaheim. Played uh, Stanford. Bill Walsh was coming back for his first game back in college football after coaching the 49ers. And we played them in the opening game in Anaheim Stadium. We got a chance out there to spend some time, took our team out to Disneyland, and really just, it was a great trip. And uh, we won that ball game, close ball game. We were actually behind at halftime, came back and won the game. And little did we know, I told the team at halftime, didn't matter, we could come back in the second half, win the game. After the game, I told them that that should be a valuable lesson to them about what can happen in a game if you keep playing hard. Little did I know that season that in six of our games we would be either down or tied at halftime and we came back and won every one of those games. We finished the year 12-0 and and we became, I think, the fifth college team in history of college football to ever win 12 regular season ball games. So, outstanding team. Uh, uh, you look at guys like Quentin Corriott, we had the, uh, uh, Jeff Granger was our quarterback for about half of that year. Corey Pulley was a true freshman. And by the middle of the year, we, we played, Corey was getting better. Uh, Jeff got knocked out uh, in a ball game uh, about the latter part of the season. Corey comes in, takes over uh, as a starter, ends up uh, playing the last game of his freshman year in Austin. Uh, we beat Texas in Austin with Corey as a freshman quarterback and then go play in the Cotton Bowl. So it's really a heck of a team and uh, I think one of the special teams in A&M history. Throughout the last eight decades, outstanding players, teams, and coaches have given the fans of the Southwest Conference an unforgettable legacy. Fantastic finishes, devastating losses, heart-stopping performances, and breathtaking triumphs define the finest football conference this country has known. These are the days of winners. These are the days of champions. These are the great days of the Southwest Conference.